Today I've got uh, an interview with Montserrat Ruiz. Hi, how are you? Hello, how are you Vic? I'm very good, lovely to see yeah. you again. It's been a while. Mm, it? It's been a while. It's a beautiful so, day. I've got... Sorry? It's a beautiful day over there and over here. Yes, yeah, we're like, yes, exactly. It's always a, always a full day. Mm. <laughs> um, so, for traditional first question is, what do you do? Oh. What do I do? Um, God, I do many things, depending on what uh, life tells me that I should be doing. So I'm, you know, I don't seem to have a very fixed role through the whole of my life. It just seems to change, but I've done quite a few things from being an actress, a singer, songwriter, lead a band, um, doula, birth assistant, I've been, and um, yeah, and also I accompany people through their own, through their journeys of crisis and, and going into the underworld and finding, finding the way out. Uh, you know, officially you would call me a psychotherapist, but I don't really respond to, to the role in that way. No. Other yeah. people would call me a modern witch or a medicine woman. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. you know, I'm just really a human in training, in a constant training and obeying what, uh, what life has to do with, you know, wants to do with me. Yes. Yeah. That's good. That's a, that's a great answer. I'm always fascinated by people's answers to this. Yeah. Um, I've had lots of interesting responses that have caught me on the back foot. <laughs> yeah yeah um, I mean I, I, I always feel like oh god I should be having one role and just one role and be completely identified but it's only recently that I, I'm just beginning to just wear it with yeah. pride you know that hasn't yeah. been my life but my life has been more in service to other things than yeah. just to fulfill just one role. Well I think that's an interesting point actually you're saying that it might be worth just sort of spending a bit of time on this because I think that is even this idea that you've got you know when you think yeah what am I you know what am I uh, what am I allowed to be sort of thing you know yeah um and you, you think that very that very question is sort of says a lot doesn't it about mm. society and how you're sort of led to believe that you can't just be a human being mm. Mm. you have to have a label Mm. Uh, and, and, and actual fact, you know, that first question is a trick question, really, mm. because, you know, it brings out that sort of response to people, um, from people. So you mentioned actress, mm. you mentioned singer, songwriter. Mm. Um, so let's go back, because that always sort of implies that y y you might have been a bit different or a bit you know, different from other people um, right. when you were younger. Is that is that true, would you say? Would you say you were... Uh, that, that I was different from other people? Well, I, I felt so. Yes. <laughs> and that was, that was the problem. Yes, yes, exactly. That's what <laughs> but, I'm getting. But I guess, I guess, you know, over the years, looking back and, you know, doing loads of uh, self-reflection and therapy and all that, you know, to kind of appease that sense of, oh, why I can't be like other people and stuff like that. I think I, I was subject to a lot of loneliness as a child. I felt re I was left alone for very long periods of time Okay. in my house um, as a child. So I, you know, that made me like a very, very shy and, and, uh, and I think that probably contributed for me to kind of engage in the imaginal world or in a, you know, in a world that, uh, you know, creativity came to save me. So how that was, because I was a gymnast as a child. Oh, okay. um, 
so it was a, a rhythm gymnastics, so it was, it, which is a mixture between ballet and, and gymnastics. So it was the, the creative uh, act of, uh, you know, creating uh, the choreographies. And then I would, then I, I, I would make my own music uh, by either recording bits of, of songs into another, you know, making like a collage of music or cutting the tape, you know, and gluing right. it with, with, um, yes, that was my first, like, like my first kind of, uh, production, yeah. uh, cutting bits of tape and gluing it with uh, nail varnish into each other. Oh, okay. so, yeah. So, so then I would have this, you know, this choreography that would start maybe with a tango and then it would go into a vault and then would go into a paso doble. It, 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 it was just to create the, the music that I would use for my, uh, choreographies and then I would design the costume so it, it I mean it was creativity came to kind of aid me out of that uh, sense of void and but as a result I guess I was in touch with that sense of void that maybe you know other kids get protected from it uh, yeah mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a really interesting point I because thinking about my own childhood I spent a lot of time in the garden on my own, mm. in my own little world. And we had this sort of garden, you know, I lived in Cornwall. Right. And we had quite a large garden that I could just get lost in. You know, it had a stream in it and, mm. and you know, bits that were to so overgrown that I could just sort of disappear into, into the undergrowth, you know, not, you know, make a, we didn't even have to make a cap. <laughs> just Beautiful. had to throw your way into something. And, um, and I think actually that does that sort of thing of being on your own yeah. is definitely something that makes your imagination just run riot, doesn't mm. it? Mm. Um, perhaps that's not the right way to do it, but say it, but that sort of engaging mm. with your imagination. Yeah. And, um, so I guess for me, it was, uh, was like a survival. So there was always a, a sense of angst underneath of it. So, you know, I right. hear about your story and I thought, oh, wow, how beautiful. You know, it was a pure, you know, for me, it was I, I was in a flat in the middle of Madrid. So there was no nature. I mean, it was my dog, my dog was there. But yeah, I guess it had a, a you know, I was very much in touch with a sense of, a, I guess as, as well, because my mother was grieving when she had me. And and she get make share with me a lot of that grief. So I was very aware of death, uh, oh. very young. So I guess when I was left on my own, uh, mm -hmm. I was I was uh, kind of aware of those you yes. know, mortality, yeah, okay. and, you know, a darker yeah. side of things. Okay. So, so you know, you know, when I hear about the, is it the Hopi? No. Yes. Yeah, the Hopi that they they. They initiate their 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 shamans. Uh, well, I don't know if this is a myth, but this is what I heard by the, the taking the little kids into a cave for nine years. Yeah. So they leave them in the cave without seeing anything else. So they, you know, they they tell them the world. They tell them the world. They don't they don't yeah. see the world as such. Yeah. So in a way, yeah, to to be in contact with that inner world inner imagination but I mean there was no guide for me so I had to no. kind of find my own way yeah because there's that thing with the Kogi isn't there the Kogi Indians of the, where they're, they're put into a, a building but they, there's no light yeah it's a cave well yeah it's but this this the, or a the, building the, there is yeah, like a yeah, building yeah. a dark is, place yeah yeah it's a dark yeah. place yeah um and I think that's a you know, that's a fascinating thing, isn't it? Because mm. for a lot of people, darkness and being in a cave is quite frightening. Yeah. And um, I knew, and there's all that, all that stuff of, like you're saying, like the, you mentioned the underworld. Mm. You know, it's very much that sort of idea of, of another place that's mm. not here. Mm. Um, that's fascinating. So uh, uh, did, you, did you grow up in Madrid then, or did mm. you leave... No, I, I grew up in Madrid. I grew up in Madrid and, um, yeah, I grew up 
there I started, um, I realized that, you know, I guess uh, in school I, when I was 15, so I started doing theater. I joined a theater group at 15 and I thought, oh, wow. Yeah, because I was really shy, but um, my mother had some artistic uh, aspirations and she always wanted me to dance or to, to be extrovert, but I was very introvert. But I found that I could do, like I could step in other people's, you know, the personas. You know? Right, okay. So, so that kind of gave me a bit of a, um, a bit of a, a, a sense of a, a empowerment, I guess, or a sense of a, okay, I can, you know, if I, I can get attention in this way, you know, I'm yes. so shy in the other way, but uh, if I'm someone else, I can dare to be, uh, if I pretend to be someone else, I can dare to be things that I, I'm, I don't, I won't dare to do as a, you know, otherwise. So, so I, I, I really like that. I wasn't very academic anyway. So I went on onto that route and I started, uh, yeah, I started uh, learning. I went to a private school, a drama school um, that follow the act, the actor studio kind of a, uh, method training yeah and oh um, right so not only could you just step into a, a character and inhabit a character then you did the, the the sort of method is like the method type of thing yes yes it's a more yeah <laughs> yeah. 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 Too yeah so yeah so i i started that like when i was 17 and at 17 i left my house i i got a job in a circus uh oh. as a dancer and oh. i i I left, I left home and I went touring with this circle, I mean circus, which literally it was like running away with a circus. Yeah, yeah. It looks, it looks really good in my CV. I bet it does. <laughs> so what's the reality of being in a circus though? Oh, it was horrible. It was I thought you were gonna quite, say quite brutal. Yeah. yeah. I, I will never forget that my first image of entering the circus you know the the car the big uh, the big top yeah. you call it yeah big, yeah we call it big top yeah. so I I was walking I I, I was uh, introduced uh, welcomed by the clown <laughs> it sounds like a, like a like a fairy tale but it was true uh, the clown was the boyfriend of a friend of mine that uh, so he he got me inside the big top and there was these these kids being trained uh, acrobats. And, and the dad was training them, you know, must have been seven, uh, eight years old girl. And she was jumping in the elastic bed, you know, doing yeah, somersaults. Uh, yeah. yeah, in the trampoline, doing somersaults. And he was hitting her with a, with a rope, you know, this thick, like, I mean, I don't know, like <laughs> four inch thick on her feet to make her jump higher. Oh. You know, and and I was like, I was terrified. I was like, oh my god, what's happening? And what what what, what is he doing? And the the clown said that that's the way we all learn. You know, so that that, that completely broke the magic for me. You know, yeah. as I as I entered, you know, the the kind of and then of course this was an old school, uh, very famous circus that had animals, uh, lions, and and uh, and. Uh, elephants and tigers and you know so you also see the, the cruelty behind behind mm. doors and yeah I had a really terrible experience with one of the clowns as well in terms of like a, an early you know a kind of rape thing happening so it wasn't uh, That's not terrific it, yes it was quite intense it was quite of a rite of passage in a way yeah yeah, yeah. Which then right, become... so that's a good start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just thinking from, from like being alone in a flat for a long periods of time with just mm. yourself and then suddenly ending up in a situation like that. Mm. This is just like from, yeah, that's, that's from one extreme to another, isn't it? Yeah, I really? mean, the, the other things happened uh, in, in terms of you know, when I started doing theater, I became. I became a bit more uh, social, 
you know, yeah. uh, more, you know, obviously more gregarious. But uh, but I think those, you know, those years of. I I, I don't know. I probably also reflecting. I I think I have had uh, a, a lot of experiences that have been quite dark, and I think that's been, in a way, that's the kind of human I am. And life takes me into very dark initiations. I mean, I'm just coming out of one now. That's why it's difficult to to respond. What do I do? Because I'm just coming out of this, and that seems to be my speciality, which also supports me to then accompany people. Yes, mm. yes. I think that's often the way, mm. actually, with things, isn't it? It's like the, your wound is the thing that's your skill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which doesn't well, logically, it doesn't make sense, but. It does make sense when you stand back and look at it. You think, well, yeah. that's you know, that's just the the nature of things. So, how long were you in the circus? No, just uh, I was just uh, three months, four months. Yeah, and then I come back and uh, to Madrid, and I did like every you know work as a waitress uh, <laughs> most of the time. Go go to, but I you see, as an actress, I didn't had much. Uh, of uh, self-esteem. So, you know, the world of the castings and all that, yes. it was just, I couldn't just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't bear it, all that rejection constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did some things I did, you know, uh, it's a strange because in some way I had no self-esteem, but then I had a huge courage to do things like, yes. you know, like, oh yeah, one day I, I dress up, I show up into a, into a director's, um, office and I said I've got an appointment with the director you know because I knew there was a casting and and just it was blatant you know a lie a blatant lie so so they let me in and and the director said a very very famous director uh, Vicente Aranda who, who's dead now <clears throat> and he said I don't have an appointment with you I said I know but I, you wouldn't see me so then he ended up giving me a, a role which he didn't even had in, no. You know, there was only a, like a part, like a like a ten session part, but he extended to twenty three, and and that was, you know, I did that uh, a film with him. It was only a short kind of like a choral uh, yeah. part, but uh, yeah. So so I had that kind of dichotomy of daring and yet, yes. you know, very introverted kind of. Uh, yeah, that's that's makeup. that's fascinating because mm -hmm. again, that's. You know, there are lots of famous people that you think are so out there, but actually they're very shy. Mm. I mean, Prince is the good example of that. I think mm. they've been put out of thin air. Yeah. But, um, you know, he's, and obviously, obviously he's not the only one like that, where you, you, on the face of it, you would think supremely confident, but actually very, very shy people. Yeah. So I mean, in my experience with later on with my band, which I had for 10 years, it, it is almost like a channeling, you know, it's not really, yes. if I would have to think, okay, just get on stage and do this and that and that. No, it, it's not, a. it's just like, uh, yeah. you're in service. Okay, just take over. And I always used to say that I was taken over by this, this female irreverent spirit Mm. Mm. So I mentioned to get onto this. Mm. So what comes what comes comes next then? Is, is it actually being involved in music then? Yeah. So so uh, after you know a few years in uh, uh, no a couple of years in, uh, yeah a couple of years studying drama, I went to study with my with my teacher's teacher in Argentina. And then Buenos Aires. So then I went there for a year, and I started. Uh, I started music training, uh, jazz, jazz training. But I had it, you know. So you know, for me, in my mind, it was like, you no, know, I can't sing. So I went from I can't sing to then be able to to sing. But obviously, that was a really long process. So I started learning music, carried on learning music in in Spain, and and then at twenty four, I decided to. You know, I decided to uh, retire from the acting, and and move to London, uh, to to be more of a musician, a singer, and you know, to focus in the music because 
in Spain, in Madrid, I was finding it's such a gregarious culture that, you know, I was finding really difficult to, to really uh, sit with my instrument. And, you know, it, it's like, as a musician, well, I don't consider myself a musician, but, you know, uh, a musician is a very kind of hermit kind of thing. You have to be practicing loads on your own, you know. Uh, then, then you go and play, but <laughs> it's like every day you have to do hours of that training, and and I was finding difficult to do that within the, you know, the acting community and stuff like that. So I, I moved to, I moved to London in 1993 with my bass and my amp. <laughs> I came, you know, I, I arrived to to Gatwick with a bass amp. And, and, and my bass guitar and I and with 200 pounds I didn't even have money to to rent a, a room for a month so yeah end up uh, moving to a squad in central London in Houston and uh, yeah I, I started practicing my bass practicing singing I got involved with the London Musician Collective, which is all about uh, free improv. So I went into that world of free improvisation, and um, yeah, and uh, it, it was a yeah, very interesting time to a very interesting avenue to all of a sudden break in the paradigm from coming from jazz or you know yeah. Brazilian music and you know that kind of that kind of world into the free pro where everything is music everything is every everything is music you know every every noise is music and yeah that's yeah fascinating um a couple of questions on this yeah about you moving to to london because mm. I, I know a, a number of people that have moved to london in order you know from other countries mm. in order to pursue music and stuff like that. Mm. What is it about London that you thought that did, did do that? Because, you know, in a way, you've already been in two countries, you know, with Argentina and one of you, that, mm. uh, or even just, you know, South America and, 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 and Spain, that have got a really distinct, you know, if, if people say, what is it about that country? They've got the music. You know, it's one of the things you could imagine that people would point to, whereas maybe they wouldn't say that about, you know, other countries. Mm. Um, but certainly with the countries that you were talking about, the Latin countries, you know, music is, some, is, is part of their identity. Mm. So what is it about London? I guess I was, uh, it was the opposite for me. It was trying to run away from identity. Yeah. To try, I, I was trying to, which then later I had to kind of, Go back, but uh, but yeah, I was try. I, I was kind of. It wasn't so much that I saw London as. Um, I was interested in the music. I was inter I guess. I was trying to create that isolation again. That sense of being separate. Oh, that's interesting. So I was trying to exile myself in a way. Yeah. And yeah. and that and London was perfect for that because you could be an completely anonymous. You know, you, Did you know that at the time? No. No, no. 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 No, of course not. It was completely coincidental. I mean, it happened to be that my 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 mom, my parents sent me uh, when I was six. They sent me to to a, a it was a friend of the fam, uh, of uh, an, a neighbor's uh, granddaughter that lived in London, and they sent me for a month to London. I didn't speak anything, any English, and they didn't speak any Spanish. And it was like a set. <laughs> but I, all I remember is that uh, that they took me to to High Park and we ate the uh, egg sandwiches. And 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 the way, and, and that was such a, I don't know, I had that experience from from London. Yeah. And, uh, and as well, I think I previous to that I went to Amsterdam and I had a with a friend and I took um, I took psychedelic mushrooms uh, and uh, that was like a and this friend was living in London so that was like a, a World Cup you know I, I, yeah, I received yeah, yeah. a message like you need to get out of Madrid and and London was there 
I, I, I don't think it was something about London, but I th looking back, I can see that in a way London provide with that sense of, I wanted to know what I was outside of my culture. Yes. And I was nothing. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and I wanted to experience that kind of uh, anonymity in order to you know, be fully free. Yeah. From it. That's fascinating because I mean, you've already, I mean, what age were you at that point by the time you went to London? 24. So by the time you were 24, <laughs> you, you've done a series of initiations, self-imposed and otherwise. It just uh, its quite incredible, really. Um, is that sort of character in the family somewhere? Of other people who do that? No, I'm, I mean, my mother was, was quite ahead of her time hmm. in a way. But um, but she, you know, she, yeah, she was exiled from her. You know, she had a, she was raped when she was uh, eighteen, so she ended up getting pregnant from that rape, and and then as a result of that, she had to kind of ex exile herself yes. from from the village that she belonged to. So she. I grew up with that, but not as a positive thing. And she always had this, you know, artistic uh, uh, and, and encourages a kind of spirit. But apart from that, you know, it, no, it was a very kind of working class. Uh, you know, I didn't grow up with music particularly. There was only music in the car. <laughs> right. So there was, we only listened to music in the car and we listened to music that was from my parents' generation, which was post-war generation, I mean, war generation, my parents were like quite old when they had me. Um, so I grew up listening to, yeah, to music from 1940s and 50s in the 70s. So yeah, that also was a, 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 a strange thing, you know, because I didn't grow up listening to the music at the time. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Mm. Interesting stuff. So, right, so you're in London, you've got London. your bike, you're, you're doing sort of avant-garde, free-form, whatever. Mm. Um, what do you do with that? I mean, what, what, you know, living in a squat. Um, I, I lived in a squad for a while, yes, and um, I, met, I met the father of my son in the squad. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, living in the squad going to classes as well, you know, mu music classes, musicianship, and going to gigs, doing gigs um, for two, three years. Then I got pregnant. And uh, I got pregnant when I decided to go to India to, to learn classical Indian uh, singing. Okay. But I didn't go in that route because life had, oh, another, okay. had another plan. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So because yeah. I got pregnant, then I I've decided to go to Mexico to learn more about parenting. Because you know what I was seeing around is like I can't do I can't do what I see here. No, okay. So I need some teaching. So I went to live in a in a community. When I went to Mexico, I didn't know where I was what I was doing. I was just following the instinct, which is you know because uh, that's why I was going to ask you why Mexico. Because um, I had so I had some friends there, I had just uh, just before before I got pregnant, I I had a tattoo in my belly, a sun, and it was it was um, it was, I designed it based on Mayan and Aztec designs. Yeah. So and then I got pregnant, <laughs> uh, and um, yeah. So I I. For some reason, I had these friends in Mexico. I went there, and obviously, I didn't know what I was going to find. I ended up living with a with a uh, indigenous community in the pre jungle, uh, in the Lacandonian uh, jungle, for a few months. Uh, they, yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah. each, it, it, all of these things are just like okay. This is just like <laughs> another another rabbit hole, isn't it? 
Yeah. That's incredible. So what, I was going to say, what, I don't even know the word. I was going to say, what did you learn from that? That sounds completely naff. I don't mean it that way. I mean, mm. how did that change your life? I, I think it's probably a better way. Being in Mexico and, well, yeah, I've, I've ended up, you know, this community was just, was just a family, but, but of artisans. They, they, they work with silver and, and amber. And, and, and the woman, the, the female, the, the mother, uh, the matriarch, I guess, of the, of the community, she was a French woman. Oh. She married a, an Indian, a Lacandonian Indian. And this woman uh, who was who she was you know, a French woman, uh, an ex um, psychiatric nurse that was diagnosed. She had a, a tumor in her womb, 400 gram tumor. And they said, okay, you need to operate this. Otherwise you're just gonna, you're gonna die, <laughs> you know, or and you're obviously never gonna have children. So she packed everything and went and end up in the middle of the jungle, in the middle of the Lacandonian jungle with this Indian uh, indigenous man, uh, quite spiritual in the, uh, he was. And she had four children in the middle of nowhere with no running water, with no uh, medical assistance. And, and one of them died, but I mean, she always said, I had four children. And the three children were absolutely, you know, full of life, thriving wild very capable kids and so i learned that for me was mind-blowing because of course i came from the western you know yeah. what, you know when i find out i was pregnant i thought well you know i just want to have a cesarean we, let's book the cesarean as soon as yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. then leaving with her and and i saw uh, her her youngest child was two was a little girl and she was in the kitchen like with knives yeah yeah you know yeah. And, and, and i and i used to take the knife out of her hand and so you know the whole of the continuum that later on i read in the continuum concept uh, uh this uh, very important book um but i i let i live it firsthand i live it I, I experience it how it how it was like to uh empower kids to 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 grow as opposed yes. of protect them. So yes. I learned so much from that experience. I learned exactly what I want to learn because he was, I can't do, I can't have children. I can't have this child in the way that I see around here because I, I don't really want to kind of stop my life in order to just follow around a baby. I, don't, I didn't want to put, and, and what I've learned that as well is that they don't put the children at the center no. of the of the village you know the of course there is a protection but the children go along with the adults and learn what yes. it is to be a human yeah. yes yeah totally i mean uh, <laughs> i mean with with regard to like with 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 children and and, and the whole education system mm -hmm. it's all about taking any form of risk away. And of course, let's face it, it's all about people being sued. Mm -hmm. At the end of the yeah. day, most of this stuff is, most of what we do is all about litigation. Um, yeah. And what happens is that you end up with people who've, who've no skills, right? Yeah. They, can't, they can't do anything. I mean, when I grew up, you know, you went off and just did stuff. You built things, and, you know, just, Got out, in, got out in nature and you discovered things and, uh, and you learn how to deal with situations. Yeah. I don't see any of that. And, uh, and No resilience also. You know, there's, there's no, so much, so much attention in being safe. Yes. That they, you know, that they, that we are making our children, uh, we are mutilating them. Yes. Know? Yes. Yeah. We're making them vulnerable. Yeah. to fragile um, i mean vulnerable yes. is okay but fragile you know you know that's a good point yeah 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 mm. yeah um so and even with the way that education works it's this business of disempowering people it's like totally. well you don't actually know anything you'd have to listen to the expert over here who's going to going to tell you how many exactly. things you got wrong in that test yeah. 
it's just all the wrong way around, you know. Exactly. And you know, we don't have to we don't have to measure things all the time. You know, things are just you know, it's not a case of things being good or bad. It's things that just life, you know. Mm. But of course, in that system, you've always got this value system that runs along next to it. And of course, that's no good. You know, and creativity, as far as I'm concerned, is mm. about creating something, discovering what it is. Mm. It's not a case of something is good or bad. It's just a thing. And the creative thing itself exists as it is, mm. you know. And I think that's a difficult thing at first for kids to wrap their heads around because they're coming from a a situation that's not like that from the educational system. Mm. And yet, of course, in the past, it would have been a case of if you were out in nature, you'd see it. You'd see it all the time. Something's hunting this, and then that thing hunts that. And it's a bit like, well, who's who's good and bad? Well, it's like, well, Mm. you don't have to make, you just know that things are a lot more complex and nuanced and yeah so that that must have been an extraordinary experience so just out of interesting with this lady then who had this mm. this tumor obviously she was cured of this tumor somehow well she had the tumor there oh she just had but the tumor she, she had the tumor she still had you know you could see she was a very um a slender woman but she had like a belly like a five month pregnant so she lived with a tumor and, you know, we lived in a, obviously there was no running water. We had to go and in order to collect the water, we had to go up the mountain, like for two miles up the mountain where there were snakes and everything. It, it was a completely, you know, paradigm shock for me, you know, like a yes. another world. I was sleeping in a little hut in, uh, by the river on my own in the floor. Uh, pre- you know, six months pregnant with a door open. Uh, yeah, it was complete, wow, a different life. So I, I've learned so much. With yeah, that sounds amazing. So grateful. I was offered to stay there, but um, to live with them, but there was something that was calling me back. So I, I came back. Okay. So you came back with the baby? No, not with the baby. I gave birth in UK. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I came back uh, pregnant and I, I gave birth and then I've decided that I was going to give birth at home and I gave birth in, in London at home and that was another huge initiation um, because that blew my mind that women, you know, it's like this is a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> it is so... And all women have to go through it. And how it comes, we are not, you know, celebrate and talking about this. And, no, exactly. And 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 of course, I had to fight in order to be able to to give birth at home because. So I I kind of become became really involved in the activism of reclaiming birth, and I became a doula. Then I was still making music, but for me, music was just bedroom experience you know like yeah we were doing gigs like very you know small gigs in 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 the london uh noise uh free improv scene uh but it wasn't something that it was uh i had any any ambition to go to make a band or anything like that so the music wasn't alongside and and i became involved with uh, being a doula uh, birth assistant and supporting women to have a, a because for me it was a, the shamanic experience you know that biggest shamanic experience i had had until then mm. you know i've had i've taken psychedelics i've done all sort of ceremonies but that innate experience in my body and giving birth and having to go through that death you know being pushed to the limits of of life and death in order to give birth, to give life, it, it, it was um, mind blowing. And uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so. You use the word shamanic. Mm. I mean, when did you, when did you sort of become interested in that? Because you said about the psychedelics mm. and stuff. Were you interested in in shamanism before all of that, or was yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I. 
I found this book when I was 18, I think. It was uh, it's from a Spanish writer, Antonio Escotado, that uh, it was like a, uh, I don't know how to call it. it. It was a book in which he talked about all the different medicines and how, what can they do and when, how. And so that really caught my imagination. Of course, I, you know, I took LSD when I was my 15. Uh, I, I experimented with, uh, but from very early on, I always sensed that these were plans to aid us and to support mm. us to go uh, further in. I never saw them as ludic, you know, things that you take for fun. I no, no, had yeah, much yeah. respect. So I did. You know, obviously in Mexico, I, you know, the the psychedelic community that I was I was hanging out with the artisans and the you know, the travelers and that was like very present there. But I I was pregnant, so I couldn't take that. But yes, and as well, uh, Carlos Castaneda, that you know his book yes. caught my imagination in my yes. early twenties. So, I uh, you know that was the kind of training. Of my mind, I was very uh, geared towards towards uh, perceiving from that perspective, and I did a lot of personal work to get out of the of the eye. And you know, I, mm. I, I, I can't remember now the the vocab you know the exact vocabulary, but yes, it did take um, took me in that route. So it was always very present the the figure of the shaman and the initiation and it's always been there since early on. One of the things that fascinates me is that once you start obviously connecting up the dots, you realise that a lot of the uh, um, psychotherapists and you know the famed people, uh, I mean, obviously Jung, mm. um, but there's a lot of other people that are really deeply influenced by shamanism and the occult and 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 one of the one of the um obviously nlp uh that i was talking to somebody about this um who who's involved in nlp mm. so i'm saying that one one stream of of nlp was was very heavily influenced by castaneda mm. but of course it's sort of been airbrushed out mm. because yeah, of course. it's like a lot of things they want to sort of you know science yeah. up Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but of course, you know, Jung, Red Book is a good example of the fact that the guy was a mystic. I mean, he was. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think that's the, the thing that we sort of have, you know, when you obviously you start digging a bit, you realise that all of that side of things, as soon as you deal with the unconscious, you, logic is absurd. It just, you know, you can't. You know, trying to trying to catch smoke, you know, um, and and I think that's one of the things that I've always found fascinating. To see you talking about the shamanism. Sometimes there's a a very good explanation for something that is not that dissimilar from what we would sort of think in in modern terminology. Mm. You just need to change a few words around. I've often thought about this with regard to like medieval explanations for people being possessed and all that sort of stuff. And if you thought, you think, well, I can take spirit and put virus in there. Mm. And then you read it and it's like, oh yeah, you can sort of go, yeah, that makes sense. It's just that they've, they've got a way of explaining something very, very functional mm. that works, obviously, because a lot of those traditions have been going on for, for centuries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just us that's sort of going along, oh no, that's nonsense. We, can't, you know, we can't put that on paper. Yeah, um, I think... It, we are so obsessed with uh, explaining things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That because and, and so we don't we don't um, nurture the capacity of being present to what is without having to explain it. Exactly. And it's, exactly. It's you know it is it is very scary to be present to to what is because there's a lot of things that cannot be explained. It's like how, exactly. How well, do you explain that? Exactly. There's so many things unknowable. Yeah. Like, for example, you know, two days ago, I just woke up thinking about an old relative, like, uh, like my mother's cousin is the only relative alive. Um, 
and uh, he, he, I, I have to get in contact with her. I haven't talked to her for many years. I wonder how she is. So I come down the stairs and I see that in my, in my uh, kitchen under the table is her card, her business card. And it's like, how is that? How yeah, do you explain like, that? Yeah. I mean, that's but, a silly coincidence, but how do you explain that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's such a lot. Of, and again, coming back to this thing about creativity, this, this is something that would actually run through a lot of a lot of the podcasts about these weird meetings that people have, you know, ch chance meetings. Oh yes. Yeah, no, have, and yeah. and they're, they're and they're pivotal moments in people's yeah. lives. Yeah. And um, and it's so common. Okay, it's it may be not common within their life because they're not necessarily spotting the things that are going on all the time, mm. but when you listen to different people, it's very common that the pivotal moment is something very odd. Yeah. Very, as we would say, you know, coincidental. Mm. But, I, ha I have that in regards to my band. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So let's go on to this. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I yeah. want to go back to the to childbirth thing. Yeah. A bit later, but let's go on to the thing with it. Well, uh, then I... I carried on, I had my child and um, I started to feel very intensely the, um, the isolation of, uh, of being a, a, a single parent really uh, in yeah. London and um, so I started going dancing on Sundays, it was like my church, you know, going back into my body and start dancing salsa and so I went into that, you know, Cuban community in London and I started, you know, it, I, I needed a little bit, something a bit more uh, warm than just noise yeah. in terms of music, you know, so I went back into the roots of Latin music and uh, learned uh, about that and started to, you know, sing in some uh, salsa bands as backing vocalist and learning and going back to my roots of uh, bolero and Latin music and stuff. So, so some years passed. My son is around five, and uh, I get uh, you know I get a phone call. My mom is not well. I have to go back to Madrid, and in three months, my mother died. You know, it was just three months. I was thirty by then, thirty-two, and two months later, my father died. So it's like, in two months, I lost yeah. my father and my mother. I came back to London and I was completely shocked by the reality of death because I had never experienced it until then, really. You know, it was like, all of a sudden, I'm a mortal human being. And it's like, and, and uh, I said, what's, what's going on? My son was asking me to have, if she, he wanted to have a brother or a sister, but I had, had a partner. So that wasn't a possibility. So I looked in the paper for a cat, you know. Okay. As you do. As you do. So like, in the loot, I don't know. You yes, the loot, totally yes, the loot. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I look for a cat, you know, looking for a cat. And then I see this ad looking for a, back, a backing vocalist. So I, I, you know, I just had death, you know, slapping me in the face and saying, this is real. And I said, okay, I call. And I call the guy. I went to visit the guy. It was a an Israeli multi-instrumentalist and in the first meeting we record one of my songs wow and this a week later on the way of getting the cat yeah yeah on the way of getting the cat yes and because I saw that ad and I responded and a week later we had a band playing my music amazing <laughs> so amazing. so uh, uh, it, it was like really is this what I need to do now I mean I both I, when, am I not supposed to be grieving or doing, but no, life said this way. And I, that's why I say I obey. So yeah, a week later we had a band called AMA and, um, and uh, yeah, and it was a collabor collaborative, uh, you know, uh, project, but it ended up being most of, most of my songs, most of my, my songs that I didn't even see them as songs, it, will, it, it was something that I was doing in my bedroom, you know, it wasn't really, yeah. So we, we, we recorded a demo uh, in 
in again because this multi instrumentalist Asi Rose, he was like so talented and so fast, uh, and he had a computer, you know, which I didn't, you know, I didn't, you know, uh, uh, we recorded. And then we went traveling with uh, this demo. We went to Spain. We travel with Baskin, with the whole band, Baskin in the streets, and that was really. It was a, a surprise for me, you know, all of a sudden being back on stage mm. with music after many years and after death. That was like a blessing, you know, like a complete blessing that, you know, the way the people were responding to to me being, you know, to, to my songs and to my lyrics and to... Uh, it was what gave me the permission to continue and to, you know, told me like, okay, follow this way you know it mm. wasn't my ambition that took me there you know or yes. or, or or my ego or my you know self-esteem <laughs> it was life that put me there and uh, and I, I just obeyed because people were responding in that way um so that band went on for a few two three years then i had to you know life led me to be the leader of the band and uh, you know and uh, and guided and uh, I I then I changed the name to La Chula, which means uh, the bold one, the on your face one, which is yeah. uh, the spirit that took over me when I when I was on stage, and that project lasted for ten years. And we yeah we recorded an album in my shed in the garden in, in, in the garden of my in the shed of, in my garden in london central london and uh with two microphones uh and then we presented it in the round at the roundhouse that's amazing a year and a half later i mean if i would have planned that would have never happened well that's incredible but, it's yeah. almost like you go look okay how do you get from that to playing the roundhouse because it's just like you know that's incredible yeah well uh we you know by then we were playing in all the underground yeah. venues possible uh i record this album basically to get more gigs really to get in the in the festival circuit yeah. uh, so it's okay it was like a demo but we we had a couple of demos before but it was like okay let's do a a proper uh album and and i was like completely seduced by the editing and and doing the the art the artwork as well you know it, it was fascinating we, we took like eight months uh editing you know the the, the thing because you know I, I was i was doing it all i never in my life had done something like that so i was learning as i was doing this and uh, in one of the first uh, mix uh, first mixes i sent it to uh, Charlie Gillett. Right, the DJ. Yeah. 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 So I sent it to Radio yeah. London. Is it Radio London? Charlie Gillett? Uh, he was Radio 3. Oh, Radio 3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Radio yeah. 3 and uh, World Service mm. later on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, he was one of the, the, the guys that invented the world music uh, yeah. title. Yeah. That was. Uh, so I sent, you know, I sent it many places. Uh, and then nine months later, he answered me. He sent me an email and he said, what, what are you doing with that album? And I said, I'm just trying to release it, you know, to self publish it, to self, uh, how do you call it? P publish it? Yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. and, and he said, okay, um, I want to play it. And he sent it. He, he asked me to send it to, to different uh, uh, newspapers, you know, reviewers. Uh, journalist and stuff and and the album was reviewed at the time in the time magazine the observer uh all with four stars in the before it was released <laughs> so, so we had we had uh, yeah and then he invited us to play the world music awards uh, that year 2007 and we played at Glastonbury, we played at Walmart, we played, you know, then doors started opening and we started touring in Europe and yeah. So because of, uh, because of that, we, uh, 
we, I don't know if you're aware of this, La Linea, Fest, La Linea is, a, is, a, is a promoter that does a Spanish, uh, well, a Spanish and Latin uh, shows, big, big, uh, big. And so through, through, the, through La Linea, we, we presented the album at the Roundhouse. Wow, so it's just amazing. That's so yes. incredible. Yes, I mean, mind blowing. But it's again, it's, it's nothing to my credit. You know, it's just life hmm. opening doors and closing doors and just hmm. sending you to the underworld and then you are in, yes. in the top of the world, next thing you know. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to, my battery's running, I just realized. Um, okay. I'm just going to go. Just to prove it's a live show, folks, as they say. Um, yeah. Gonna have to move slightly to get plug in. Um, so yeah. So what? When I first met you, yeah. I don't think you were playing. No. You finished, didn't you? Yeah. No. I, I, so you what, know, the, the same that I, the, it is given, <laughs> it's taken. Yes. Yeah. So what? Um, what was what happened there? Because you would obviously been playing a lot and traveling a lot. I, I was, you know, for ten years. Like that was like two thousand two to two thousand. Uh, well, actually, I moved to Brighton in two thousand and ten, and the plan was to record a second album. Um, and I, I was gonna do it with my partner at the time, who was my best player by then, and we were moving here, in Brighton to record the second album. And after a week of me being here, my partner said that he wasn't moving and he, you know, he just dropped me here. I didn't know anyone in Brighton. So it was, you know, <laughs> it was time to visit the underworld again. Mm. So that broke me completely, broke, uh, broke my band because, uh, you know, all the mem my band members were in London. You, you know, I tried to reform here in Brighton, but it was not um, it was not possible because no one knew me uh, no. here in Brighton. And also the good musicians were involved in other projects. It was really hard. So I kind of did some more gigs in, you know, I, the, my last gig, funny enough, was uh, in Germany at an institute for mental health that they hire, you know, the, gave us a lot of money to go there and it was like that's quite coincidental so then in those years those kind of two years of really that uh, that breakdown uh, I kind of finished my training in in as a therapist as a psychotherapist so when uh, did you start doing that when you moved to Brighton I, I started doing that all through my you know since I you know since I was since I was 17 I was interested in you know I, I started doing my own ther therapy for myself so I didn't arrive there as a change of career I arrived there of a lifetime interest in the you know in, in in mind and the unconscious and so when I arrived to Brighton I kind of finished my training I had started before in London before I came uh, to Brighton I did a year of foundation with the Philadelphia Association which is R.D. Lang yeah. uh, the anti-psychiatrist and in, in, in psych, psychoanalytic uh, psychoanalysis and, and philosophy so I had quite a lot of training already done but I kind of finished my training when I when I arrived to London at, at the back of the bereavement and I did most of my speciality in bereavement in you know, working with people uh, that I have uh, had some people dying on them you know like their, their loved ones have died and yeah and that's I guess that's a couple of years later that's when I met you mm. I was I was doing I was doing that and so so yes that silenced me for three years I didn't sing for three four years yeah. But then you obviously started doing things on videos and stuff where you're singing on your own. Well, yeah, that was, uh, I'm aware of the time. I don't know if we, how, how are we on time? No, I'm all right for the moment. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise we can, you know, we've got a choice. We can either, because there's a whole bunch of other stuff that 
we haven't even got to yet. So. I know, I know. So it's up to you. Are you all right for time? Or... I'm all right for time. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm all right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, I was in this new life uh, working with soul, which is what I, you know, I call it soul work because that's, you know, it's the deep work. Uh, and then, and then menopause arrived. Right. I can't speak to that at all. No, you can't, but I can speak <laughs> yes, I for, you can. forever. Because, <laughs> again, having been a doula and having, you know, kind of, uh, ser you know, try to learn what the, you know, the ecology of being in a woman's body, in a female mm. body, and trying to service that as much as I could. Um, yeah, when menopause hit, it was like, what is this? Why nobody's talking about this? Why I haven't heard it. I mean, that was so intense. That was like a, even more intense than a birth. Because a birth, you go through it 24 hours later, you, you're back. But this, you enter a descent that there is no guarantee you coming out. It just feels so, you know, it was so, and, and such a novelty for me, even though I was trained as a holistic childbirth educator and I was a doula and all these things, all, all this business. So this took me into a, into a huge descent that, you know, it's only now I'm coming out of it, not just because of the, the physical, you know, the, the physiological experience of menopause, but what came with it as well in terms of uh, my, so, you know, what, what happened in my family as a result of many things that were happening. So, um, yeah, so there's quite a lot, there's quite a few stories that happened with that. So when I realized I was, uh, I started to feel like a, I was dying or, you know, my, or I had a sense of giving up and I was really tired. I was physically feeling sick. So I thought, you know, maybe I, I'm having some early dementia or I don't know what, what is happening. So I went to a doctor and the doctor told me at 44, I was 44 at the time, but I was, I had the hormone levels of a woman in menopause and, and that was complete shock. Again, a really felt sense of mortality. Like for the first, very first time, I saw my death as a reality. And then it's not like something was cognitive or rational or logical. It was a real experience of, okay, this is really real. And I really saw it in that moment. Because, I mean, the intensity, the psychic intensity that you can experience there, that we can explain it as hormonal levels doing this and that in that to your brain. Yeah. 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 You can also say, okay, a woman goes into psychotic state in, in that state, but also it's like the intensity of psychic material that I was having in my dreams. Mm. It was, I couldn't keep up with the amount of imagery and messaging that my dreams were sending mm. me. And the, the sense, you know, going through the hot flushes, for example, it, it, was, mm. it was just like, a, I, I, I mean, this is, it cannot get more shamanic than, than, than this. Yeah. It's like men go and, and, and don't eat for seven days in a cave or hang themselves from some, but you know, this is as intense as that. I recognize it because I had walked that territory before mm -hmm. in my life. Um, so intuitively in that moment, when I was told that by the doctor, it's like, I need to do, I need to do a pilgrim. I need to do a rite of passage here. I need to. So something told me that I had to go. I had to go to Montserrat, which is the mountain that gives me my name. And as well, I knew that my daughter, who was 12 at the time, she was going to enter her own menses. You know, she was about to enter her own rite of passage that I was you know, at the other Leave. end, yeah, yeah, that yeah. I was leaving. So it's like, okay, we need to do a ritual. We need to go to, we need to go to, 
to Montserrat, because that, that's where she was conceived in, in the mountain in Montserrat in Spain, which is the, the land of my ancestors. Yeah, so, I mean, you can't get more, you're talking about coincidence. No, I mean, you know, sorry, I don't use that word, but you know, you look at that and you go, okay, hmm. yeah. 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 So, so there it started a massive journey, massive journey that, uh, yeah, one day maybe I'll write a book about it, but yeah, so we, we went and walked the mountain and I took my daughter, I mean, I took my daughter out of school for a week in order to do this pilgrimage. Um, we walked the mountain. I tried to kind of do, you know, something in silent with, with, with her, you know, to do a ceremony, although already there I could see the, you know, the culture interfering with it and not, not giving a blessing to that. We went to my mother's village. It was incredible uh, how, even though we didn't know anyone, but the land was kind of receiving us in in a particular way with you know it's just so much that i don't know what what to go into or not but there was something really important there is a point i'm telling you this as we arrived to the my mother's village she uh, um, the town hall had organized a walk around uh, around the village um to discover the medicinal plants yeah, so we arrived to the village, we go to this walk. My great grandmother was a herbalist. She was a weed, you know, like a like a healer through herbs, which I never met. And but it was like being received by, you know, that was the experience. That it was like we were received by my great grandmother through the I mean, I'm just talking about it now. I'm just getting all goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, and it, the talk was in Catalan. I mean, we didn't even understand. I mean, I understand a little bit. My daughter didn't understand anything, but it was like we were understanding everything. It just felt so right. And this walk was around the cemetery, so we knew where the cemetery was. So two days later, we went on the Sunday. We went and had. Uh, some we went to a spa, which is it's not a spa, it's terms, it's like old Roman terms, because the land has uh, hot, hot uh, uh, waters. And that's where my great grandfather used to be a, um, a chef. So we <laughs> went to have the terms where my great grandfather was. And then after that, we went to the cemetery and walk around the cemetery. I had a little tambourine, I was singing songs. And uh, we were looking for my grandparents' um, grave, and we couldn't find it. But I kept, I kept singing. Uh, started raining. It was an all, all, only a small cemetery, and and in the last stretch, as we are leaving the cemetery, my daughter find, fa found my great grandparents' grave. And I could not Im uh, tell you the the sense of having a, arriving home. Like I never in my life thought that seeing a grave would have that effect mm. in us. So mm. it, it was like we come from here, really, and this is a testimony. Mm. So we put flower, cut flowers, we sang some songs, and. But we couldn't find my my grandparents' uh, grandparents' gr uh, uh, grave, hmm. and uh, all right, mystery. I don't know. Next day we're leaving after a week of so many serendipities. I mean, we went into town one day, the last day, and we passed the um, butchers. And I remember, I remember that woman. That woman in the butcher shop. When I was a child, I used to go to my mother's village. And I went in and as I remember she was a young woman then. And by then she was like late 70s. And I said, hi, I, I'm Carmen Pusdomene's daughter. And she was, oh my God. 
she, she started telling us stories about my mother in front of my daughter she, that hadn't met ever met her. So it was so serendipitous and so incredibly powerful and mm. unprepared and completely, you know, improvised and spontaneous and that they were living. I call I call this cousin of my mother that I just found the card the other two days ago. And, and I said, we couldn't find my parents, my grandparents' grave. And, and she said, oh, I know why. And she sent me a photo. She sent me a photo of, of my grandparents' um, funeral certificate. And in that grave, then the next person that was uh, buried was somebody without somebody that didn't belong to the family. So that, I said, what, what does this mean? And then she tells me, your mother sold the grave of your grandparents because she couldn't attend it. So in oh. that moment, what the sent, I just started sobbing. And I knew that I had to go there to realize the rupture yeah. that had happened right then. It probably yeah. happened before, you know, it probably happened when my mother was exiled because of her yes. because of her rape. And also generationally, I think that's the generation post-war that started yeah. abandoning the traditions and abandoning yeah. the the knowledge that looking after your dead is something that you do, you know. Yeah. So so right there and then it's like, oh my, what do I have to do to repair this rupture? And I have to buy it again. I have to buy the grave again. How am I going to do that? Or, you know, it's just, and in that moment when I'm pondering and I'm sobbing and like taken by the coins, you know, the magic of life, this voice comes into my mind and says, learn the songs of the land. So that was how I started learning the songs of the land and started learning the songs that then I called them the songs for the dead. Yeah. Uh, and that was my my accompaniment through what came after, you know, which it was uh, uh, this last, you know, it's been years of of this of, of a descent because then the the council, uh, the Brighton Council, took me to court uh, because of that week. Uh, oh, God! Taking child out of school. Yeah, that is insane hmm. Hmm. but uh, but so i had to defend that later on but uh, but that's how i go back uh, that's how i went back to singing and um, after three years of not opening my mouth yeah hmm. and 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 it, it was you know i wasn't singing for people i was singing for the land you know that was hmm. my way of of uh, like it was a, like a ceremony like a private ceremony to give songs to the land in order to repair that that rupture with my ancestors that happened through my mother I guess uh, because she she let go I understood very much that why she yeah, did yeah, it yeah. you know yeah mm. yeah gosh I mean <laughs> that's that's just so there's so much there <laughs> Sorry, so, am I? Am no, I no, no, it's you? brilliant, brilliant. Because you know, I think this is another thing that I, I sort of try. I have a problem with because the arts are so commoditized. You know, it's like, well, you can't do that because you can't mm. make a living out of it. Type of mm. attitude, which is why you know arts are underfunded and and all the rest of it. It's not, you know, that's not what the arts are about. The arts are about discovering yourself and you know, exploring other aspects and connections with the world through through what it what it is that mm. you do. Um, so this, um, I'm quite intrigued by this court case thing because I've not actually mm. heard of anybody actually being taken to court about taking the children mm. out of school. Um, so that's a bit strange. How did how did that resolve itself? Or, mm. Well, the thing is that. That was the beginning of the per of the 
what it was end up being 13 months pilgrimage, right? Uh, because when I then when I come back, when I come back of this incredible journey, uh, instead of a homecoming, we got a letter from the council saying, okay, you've got a fine. And I said, well, I can't pay this fine. And it was only 60 quid. I could have paid the fine, but it's like, this is not, no. I cannot do this because this was no. very important. And I did say to the school that we were going in a spiritual pilgrimage. Yes. yes. So they they failed to acknowledge that or they they failed to give importance to that they said that i you know that i wasn't allowed to do that because it was april and the offset numbers were you know because it was the end of the year they couldn't afford yes, having yeah, children not uh, going to school and and uh, and i said well that, that's not all right so so they they sent me a letter to go to speak in uh, with some people in the council they record me like i was uh, you know, they made a recording out of it, and I was completely confident that once I told the story, they were going to be, oh wow, you know, thank you for doing something for your child, which is important, you know, and for yourself, and you know, so, so such a deep experience. Um, so I, I left it to that. In I went to America. Uh, Martin Shaw invited me to go to the to the uh, Great Mother and Father Conference in in Maine. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to as well to take some to be blessed by Dr. Stairs because that, that was one of yeah. The, yeah, yeah one of the the visions that I also got on that day where it's like who are going to be my elders who are going to guide me through this menopause and and she was the one of the people that came in my mind so I want to to meet her for five days. And when I come back, that's when I got the letter. And I was really clear that I had to go in the land. I had to go and leave of, you know, in the middle of the land, I had to leave my practice. I had to leave Brighton and take my daughter and, and, and leave. I've got a piece of land in Spain. So that's, that was the, that was the, 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 the instinct that I had to do that. So uh, that I had to do that in order to, to be able to be present to this. And which is very remarkable because it's very important to acknowledge that women don't have the time, don't have the space to be present yeah. to the enormity of what happens through them. Because as grief, is something that we can choose not to experience. Yes. So, so I chose to experience it. So, it took myself, and it took me a while because there was a lot of conflict with my partner at the time. He didn't want me to go. Anyway, finally, I struck myself. And as we arrived to Spain, to an off grid, no running water, no central heating, complete magic you know but uh then we get the letter from the brighton council that um i need to prove on court in court that what we did was a spiritual um pilgrimage uh because they gave me a call and said but so what is your religion and and i said actually you know very well that if i tell you i'm muslim or if i tell you i'm christian you're gonna respect my religion. But I'm not gonna tell you I'm Muslim or I'm Christian. I can tell you I'm pagan, but I don't belong to a church. So, so in, 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 based on, on that response, they, they took me to court. That surprises me of all places. Hmm. You know, you would have thought that Brighton hmm. or all of its, you know, the way it sort of paints itself as being accepting of all sorts. Right. Could yeah. But, but because they, I know, I, I think, I think they wanted to create an example. Hmm. Oh, it, all this know, stuff. Like, yeah. 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 So, so then 
even though I managed to extract my, myself and my daughter out of the system in order to do this, then the system follow us there. <laughs> and it was like, no, you, you're not allowed to go. Hmm. You're not allowed to do this. That you don't, I mean, after, you know, when we went to the land, I took my daughter out of school. And so she was officially home educated. That was not a problem. It was that week, that week, that pilgrimage. And for me, it was like, I have to, I have to stand up for this. Yes, because in I, actual fact, it was part of the thing. Exactly. Exactly. So, so it came with it. That was the... Exactly. <laughs> that was part, part of it. Mm. So I, I was there in the middle of a, a piece of land with no internet connection, um, having to write, you know, like I, I didn't have the money to pay a, a lawyer. And anyway, we couldn't find a lawyer that would represent me because the only lawyer that I found, that actually Mark found, uh, was uh, he said, you're going to lose you know you have no there's no there's no precedent of any case like this there's only one precedent of a of a kid that didn't go to school because of a say because a, 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 a catholic um, festivity or something like that but uh you're gonna lose it just uh accept it and i was like no i can't i have to i have to stand up for this so <clears throat> It was a time of like deep, dark descent, you know, in a way, because I felt completely bereft of community and support, you know, because mm. in my community in Brighton, this Brighton alternative community, no one, you know, even the the organization for which my partner worked, that's a, a, an organization that's meant to do rites of passage for young men, they didn't they said that you know they washed their hands. They didn't. They didn't want to get involved in it at all. So I, I felt so much on my own that it's like, what am I going to do? So I started writing letters to to writers. You know, I wrote uh, to to people that have kind of influenced me in my life and tell them the story. I wrote to the pagan. Um, Federation, the uh, yeah, Pagan Federation. I wrote, you know, to many organizations to, asking for, to back me up in this. I mean, I don't know how they were gonna, could back, him, back me up, but I just, I, 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 I was like, I can't believe. I, I wrote to Martin Shaw, I wrote to Dr. Estes, uh, Toko Pa, uh, Starhawk, um, Vicky okay. Noble, like, and, you know, people that have influenced me, and um, and uh, you know, I didn't hear anything for a long time. For for a few weeks, we were about to. You know, there was two weeks left, and um, and this is a very important bit. Uh, I was one day driving down the mountain, and and I saw a cat on the side of the road. And this was like two weeks before, two weeks before the court case. And I was still in the land. I was driving down the mountain and I see this cat sitting by the side of, side of the road and he looks at me or he or she. But it, it's rare that some, you know, that you have this kind of sense of, this cat is looking at me and my eyes, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're having this moment of connection. Mm. And as I pass, I wasn't driving fast. I was driving maybe 40 miles an hour, something like that, or less, 30. And I pass and I hear this noise under the car. And I look in the mirror and I see that the cat has suicide, <laughs> committed suicide. He, after he saw me, he ran underneath of the car and I killed the cat. And I've never killed anything <laughs> in my life. It was so, uh, shocking. So I saw the cat like life coming out of him. Mm. You know, he was like, Yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. The middle. So I drove back and, and the cat was, yeah, completely, it was dead, blood everywhere. And that was like, uh, What does this mean again? Mm -hmm. What does this mean? I don't understand what happened in that night. 
Mm. I was in hell the whole night. I was in hell. I felt like I was, you know, I was in a medieval witch being hanged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in total darkness. And in the morning, letters start to arrive. Letters from Martin Show, Staho, Tokopa, Vicky Noble, the Pagan Federation offered to come and 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 represent, you know, the Pagan Federation president at the time offered to be my witness state. Uh, witness uh, statement. Uh, the 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 secretary offered to be by my side as a Mackenzie friend, you know, Mac to support me because I had to represent myself. And uh, you know, by the day that you know, by the court day, it was like fifteen letters have arrived to the court from. All over the world. I mean, not from Brighton, but no. from all over the world. And I arrived to the court, and then these three men that was like three magic kings arrived that I didn't know. They came from all over UK to support me in this, and we presented. I I presented it, and we won. Amazing. So what? How? How did, you know, how did it get to that? All that money, you know, from the point of view of doing a prosecution, mm. you know, for 60 quid. Mm. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. For 60 quid. I mean, just to, to, obviously, if I would have gone, uh, I mean, the, I, I had some people that got in contact with me, some people that were trying to, to fight, uh, to, to fight this law. And, but I didn't want it to approach it as a right to take your child out of school. I wanted to approach no. it for what, for what it was. Yes, you know, of course. From the absolutely. spiritual perspective. Yes. And, yes. and obviously there was no cases of, of these. And, no. you know, at the time I didn't want to do a, a lot of noise either. You know, some people wanted, you know, some journalists from the Times wanted to uh, interview me, but I, I just didn't want to do a lot of noise about it. I didn't, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, I I kind of became uh, the scapegoat of something, or you know, they just wanted to use that. They, I don't think the prosecutor had any idea that I was going to have any point. The interesting thing is that cat, because I mean, you were saying about the story of the cat, yeah, being the thing that instigated your musical, you know, the band. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like the cat was the scapegoat goat for this. Absolutely. This it was the sacrificial sacrificial it's thing. I mean, there is there is another coincidence as well, is that oh. after a year of the band uh, formation, the, the this this same guy uh, called me and said, I've got a cat for you. So we end up having two cats. Uh, for 19 years, and my cat just uh, the the latest. I think you've met my cat. Yes, my I two have cats. Met yeah. So uh, my last one has just died last week on my oh. arms. Yeah. Oh. After I'm 19 sorry. 19 years, yeah. I mean, because they were they were. How can I put it? They were cat cats. Like, because I remember we were around at your place, mm -hmm. and one of the cats was asleep. Yeah. There's a great gathering of people, and the yeah. cat got up, literally went out the cat flap, and killed a pigeon. Oh, right. Like, do you remember that? Yeah. It was like <laughs> it came out of a sleep state, straight mm. out, killed a pigeon, mm. and then I think it shocked everybody because it was a cat being a cat, you know. <laughs> yeah. But that was amazing. No, no, it was my, like, how did that yeah. cat know there was a pigeon out there? My cat's. Was, yeah. yeah, they were quite. They were quite of hunters, and and yeah. But they also did it. They didn't. They didn't do it at any time. Mm. It was very interesting to observe that there was when there was something going on energetically yes. in the house. Yes, if they, they would come. They would come kill it, and and I've got a story about you know one of the cats bringing me hearts at yes. a particular time of my life. But yeah, they they would only bring always bring the animal and kill it under my altar. So it's like, yes. is that yeah, yeah, a yeah. sacrifice? Yeah. yeah. 
I do, you know, when I, 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 I just did a talk at mm. the um, Into the Wild Festival about house right. protection magic, you know, obviously like from a traditional point of view and honestly. Mm. And of course, one of the things is I, I do, I get people dousing. Mm. Um, and, uh, and of course, one of those things is that you can walk into a house and you, you, or walk into a garden and, and wherever the kills are, the kill site tends to be some important mm. you know, point yeah. energetically in a house. Mm. Um, so you sort of think, well, the cats are doing things on this level that, you know, and could you see cat, like the, the story I just told about your cat? Mm. I mean, I've seen one of my cats just walk across a garden and just kill a mouse. It wasn't waiting for it. It just like, it's like, oh, it's over there type of thing. It just literally went over and pounced on a mouse. Mm. You think, mm-hmm. yes, how do you know it was there? Because you couldn't possibly know it was there. Yeah. So they are quite extraordinary creatures. Mm. No, I've, I've, they've, they've, over the years, they've done all sort of things. And then one, one, one time, I mean, this is a, an amazing story, but do, do you want to hear it? Yes, go on. Lay yes, on me. it's just an amazing story. Uh, one day we were, I used, we used to, uh, well, I still do uh, see people at home. So like the work, my work is at home. So one day I was, uh, we were, uh, my ex-partner and I were uh, working with a, a client and, and they, and, and and I usually used to sit on my, you know, on my food. So he asked me to get a glass of, if I could get a glass of water for him. And my food was numb. So I st- when I stand up, I'd really twist my ankle. And I was like, oh. okay, okay. So but when we were in the session, I brought him the glass of water. We're in, we're in the session. We hear this massive noise upstairs in the room upstairs, in my daughter's room. I, we finished the session and when the client went, we'll go upstairs and we see the girl, you know, the female cat, which was not, you know, she usually was good with birds and the male was mainly rats and mice. And, but she was the, the, the bird girl. And at the time, my male cat had had a tumor in his jaw and he, he was nearly put, he, he the, 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 the vets wanted to put him down and would refuse. We said, no, if he's gonna die, he can die at home. You know, let die, let let death give it, let's give a chance to death and let him die at home. We don't need to kill him. So he was like convalescent, coming out of this tumor that let him live for another five years hunting. Yes. Him. You know, yes. uh, but but he was, you know, he wasn't climbing very much, or, you know. But so we go upstairs and we find the, girl, the female cat with a dove and she's gnaw, gnawing her, her wing. And so we take the girl and, and we put the dove in, in a, in a shoebox and, you know, a few minutes later died in, in Mark's hands. Uh, so next day, because I, tw- I twisted my ankle, I had bereavement, I, had a, I was running a bereavement group and I couldn't go because I twisted my ankle. Uh, I couldn't walk. So I got up and I was in bed like uh, lying in and then I see this dog looking outside my window. And it's just there looking in the window, looking in the window. And I was like, what, what's going on? That's really weird. Looking, you know, upstairs, because my bedroom is upstairs in the same floor where the the, the other dove was taken by my cat and she is looking in in this other dove is looking in and so I come out and the dove doesn't move come out to the balcony like that the dove doesn't move and then I what what is this so I go into Facebook and I I said I've got a dove outside is this is it possible that it's looking for the for the mates oh, yeah, yeah. and people respond yes yes they made for life i didn't know at the time they made for life they need each other this was in september they need each other for the winter to get through the winter and so you need yes it's probably looking after that so i i, I thought okay so i'll go so maybe i i should bring the dove back so i call my partner like 
where is it? What, what, what did you what did you do with the dog? And he said, I left it in the woods. So okay, told me where. And I went with my with my uh, twisted ankle to find the dead dog in the woods and brought it back. In the meantime, I put the female cat, locked her in the bathroom so she wouldn't do anything to this dog. The male cat, because he was convalescent, he wasn't even going up the table, so there was no danger of that. So find the dead dog, bring it to the dog, and I stay there sitting with a grieving dog for an hour or something, singing songs, playing on my drum, and and after you know an hour and a half, you know, I, I don't know, she didn't come and look at it. I mean, she was just there, static, and I was drumming, singing, and the dog was there, wasn't flying away or anything. Anyway, so as I, I was hungry, it was one o'clock or something, and I said, I'm gonna eat something, and as I turned my back, in the corner of my eye, I see the male cat climbing the balcony. And as I see him climbing the balcony, he's jumping to the, he's going towards the dead dog. So I do like that, jumps onto the, into the alive dog. The dog doesn't even flap his, her wings. She just gives herself completely to the cat and the cat eats the whole dog in front of my eyes. That is incredible. And when he finished, he eats the dead dog. That is incredible. So, I mean, obviously I felt really guilty, but it was, this was a, a lesson beyond yes. my guilt, beyond my acting. Yes. It's like, this yes. was, this ha had nothing to do with no. my intervention. This was no. life. Yeah, that is extraordinary. I was going to just mention we had a situation with squirrels like that. Right. We had a squirrel that we'd had a problem in the roof. And it, well, I just thought it was rats because they, they sounded like something with boots on them, right? Mm. So we went up. Yeah. And what had happened was that one of the, the sort of ventilation things had come loose. Um, yeah. And this, these squirrels had got in because they can cause a lot of damage. So I shut this thing up, and of course I didn't realise I'd trapped one of them in there. <laughs> so what happened was that we had a squirrel looking through the window. And we thought, that's weird. Just looking through the kitchen window. And then um, we went out, and this squirrel ran along the, the eaves of the house and watched us get in the car. So he came back. You know, doing shopping or something, and the squirrel was still there, waiting for us. And I thought, oh, that's weird. So maybe we've trapped one of them in the roof because I didn't realise that's what we've done. So I got the ladder out, and it watched me as I took the lid off, moved, got off the ladder, and the two, the, the other one came out, and they both ran up the tree. Right. So this this squirrel was like, look, yeah. I can't get her out of there or him out there. Can you, you know. She let you know. She, yeah. she or he let yeah. you know. Yeah, that there's something was have. That's that's remarkable. Do they partner as well? Squirrels? I must do, I suppose. No. But I mean, that was yeah. definitely what was going on. It was just mm. that one of them mm. was trapped in the roof. Right. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so that's um, an interesting story. But that that the story is the story of the dove. That's that's incredible. But, but she gave herself. That's the first time yeah. I witnessed that. She didn't fight at all. She completely, as soon as the cat got her, she just gave herself. It's like it was like self-sacrifice. Yeah, true. I never seen something like that. And nine months later, as I was, because me and my partner separated. And it wasn't a something that I, it was planned or it was quite difficult at the time. So nine months later, I was pondering and what did that story meant in terms of what was the message for us? Was it like our hearts, our, we had to sacrifice something and it had yeah. to be eaten by life. Yes. And, and the fact that yes. both doves end up in the same in the stomach of my cat. Of the, same, the same cat. Of yes. the same cat. It was like they went back together somehow, yes. you know, live. And so I'm thinking of this, I'm writing in my in my sitting room. 
and I hear this noise under my altar and I look around and I see my male cat eating a dog. As I'm thinking this, I go, okay, I'll leave it. I leave it, I carry on writing. And when I come out, it was just a pool of feathers and a perfect intact heart on top of it. Right, that is incredible. Yeah, so, so yeah, cats. cats. Yes, <laughs> cats. cats. Oh, Monty, that was fantastic. Yeah. That's such a wonderful chat. It might be two episodes, I think. All right. Well, yeah. That's good, though. That's good. Yeah, it's a little bit a little bit eclectic, but it's just like... No, uh, I like it. My I like life. It like <laughs> but um, as I say, when, you know, when people tell their stories, I think, because obviously there's so much inter interlinked. Yeah. You know, and, and underneath a lot of those stories, it's almost like, I won't say it's the same message, but... It, it, there is a it's like a ripple isn't it mm. lots of things that are very very yeah very similar. yeah life yeah. is such a such a wondrous thing isn't it it is it is and i think as you get older you realize how extraordinary it is really it's, uh, you, know, you get a chance to sort of savor it back anyway it's lovely speaking to you a pleasure um, yeah and uh, thanks ever so much for your time it's really good Thank you for, for the chat. No, it's a pleasure. <laughs>